everybody. Welcome to another Zebra Central Image Breakdown. We got our guest today, Alex Bohr. Welcome. Thanks for being a part of this. Hello. Good to be here. Thanks for having yeah. me. I was excited to have you be a part of this. It's going to be a lot of fun um, having you. I'm looking forward to this. So those that may not know what we're going to be breaking down of Alex's work, this is the piece specifically that we're going to be looking at today, which you did this for the Raphael Corsetti uh, contest that just recently happened. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it was uh, November 2021, I think. So yeah, and then you came in third. You came in third, yes. right? So congratulations, yes, third place. Thank you. Well, that's awesome. I was super psyched. Yeah, well, still am. Yeah, it's a sweet piece, man. It's awesome. Thank you. Awesome work. So we're going to be breaking this down with him. He's going to show you guys a bunch of little tips and tricks, and some things that he did to get uh, to this point um, in this image. So. I'm excited to have you. Thank you again for being a part of this uh, stream with us. My pleasure. So we're going to get right into having him uh, showing everything. Um, as always, I will be monitoring the chat and then trying when I can to uh, send some questions his way. But of course, we want he's got a lot of stuff he wants to show you guys. So I'm not going to be able to just bombard him with questions. But by all means, uh, in the chat, throw any questions that you might have. And I'll do my best to filter them out to Alex as we go along here. All right, so we're gonna put Alex's screen up. Oh, there you go. The screensaver. All right, so yeah. here is the final scene for the Abyssal Matriarch character that I made for the Grissetti challenge. Um, yeah, actually it runs relatively smooth, 85 million polygons. So I think of this as, I had like three main uh, ways of working in ZBrush on this project because she's she's basically she has you know the skin her, her body herself anatomy and all that and that's kind of my traditional sculpting and a lot of kind of the way I like to use ZBrush most honestly and then clothing which a lot of that was done in Marvelous Designer for cloth simulation but then I would touch those things up in ZBrush and then necklaces and jewelry and actually separated them out onto little visibility layers so as you can see in the end, she doesn't even have a full body, but I knew exactly like the camera angle and everything I was going to use. So I didn't bother too much with the areas that I wasn't going to be sculpting or uh, seen in the final image. So there's the skin layers, the fabric. <clears throat> and again, a lot of this was done in simulation, but then touched up in ZBrush afterwards to add like secondary wrinkles, things like that. Um, and then the jewelry is the third layer. And then more or less, I used the same kind of workflows for each thing. Like the jewelry is all sort of made the same way, the way that I was most comfortable with at the time. And then same thing with clothing and, and skin. So those were like kind of the three main ways that I use ZBrush to make the piece. So I can dive a little bit into each one and kind of explain the process and my thought process on it. Um, and I was just going to go ahead and start with some anatomy and sculpting skin and things like that. How, how long did you get for the contest again? Uh, it was about a month long contest. I forget exactly, but it's, it's in that range. Yeah. So most of this was done in my free time. Uh, I was working during the contest too. So, <clears throat> so this is the midnight oil working on this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I did have to like, you know, cut corners where I could. I mean, it goes right. back to like the stuff that wasn't seen on camera. Well, I mean, I couldn't resist like making the wings look like, yeah. night. like how could I not? So <laughs> yeah. I knew I wasn't going to see that stuff, but I'm like, I got to figure out the anatomy on this sort of thing. So, uh, nice. but I did like cut, of course, like all these corners where you just can't see the stuff. I was like, I'm not going to touch that. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's right. about a four week project. Cool. So I start with a base mesh. Um, you can, I mean, start with anything in ZBrush, spheres, fine and stuff. Uh, I think there's advantages to using a base mesh, uh, mostly like with the eyes and mouth, because it's, it's kind of annoying to like make little divots and things uh, like that with a, a sphere. And then I don't know, having to worry about it. It's like topology becomes an issue. Um, so, you know, like you always want to have the nice rings and things like that. Even when sculpting, it makes like smoothing and things like that a lot easier. Um, so yeah, I was just going to kind of make this character look somewhat like 
what I had done for the project and just kind of explain the thought process. Um, so I always think like the most important thing when sculpting is thinking about like the major forms and how like large you want things to be, how small you want things to be. Um, when I was first starting off with sculpting, it was always like, <clears throat> I would always kind of like jump into the minor details so quickly to where I couldn't tell like if something was turning out to look good or look the way I wanted it to. So I'm always like a huge advocate of not going to like second subdivision, third subdivision super fast and just kind of like working with a low level topology. I'm gonna give her that big nose again. That's my favorite part. Um, and you're mostly just using the move brush and smoothing it out. Where you yeah, it out. yeah. I'm I use the move brush a lot. So you tend to do this with your base mesh to get something that's already got topology flow, or are you usually also dynameshing? Do you find you, yourself? I usually I'll eventually end up dynameshing because it'll start to stretch. Especially it's like the further you go away from being human. Yeah. the more you get like that stretching and i know eventually i'm not going to want to sculpt on these like really crazy geometries so once i get to that point and like it's kind of like when i'm in sub v2 and 3 i'll i'll like decide it's time to zero mesh okay um, yeah so you work with a nice topology divide up a little bit and then switch to dynamesh yeah yeah, yeah. i really like to do things that way it yeah. keeps it clean at like yeah. the time that i think it's most important for things to be clean which is like early on in the project and then, uh, and then, like once once it gets more specific, and the things that you want to do with the sculpting is more specific, then I can uh, your mesh and dyna mesh and make sure I have like the actual geometry that I need. What was your inspiration for her? Like, what what were you pulling? She looks a little bit like Meg. A little, I get a little Meg from Meg. Uh, yeah, so she's the. Have you seen uh, the legend? No. Oh man, you should look that up. You probably love it. She <laughs> reminds me a little bit of her, a little bit. What was your inspiration? I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show. So I I made like a mood board. I knew it was an underworld yeah. challenge, so I wanted to like, I don't know. Whenever I have a challenge prompt, I'm like, I just try to absorb concept art and whatever I can for for a bit. And one of my favorite concept artists is uh, Peter Jablonski. I'm probably saying that wrong, but. He's worked on like Dishonored and a bunch of other stuff, but his his whole aesthetic is like totally my favorite yeah. stuff ever. Nice. So this this particular image, I was like, I like this vibe. So you can see the resemblances probably already. I was like, I want a big nose and like a witch like character, and then, um, but I wanted basically my character to fit in with this kind of these sorts of ideas. Yeah. So that was kind of my like mood inspiration for it. Oh, cool. Um, oh, cool auto save. Very nice. And what about anatomy wise? Do, what are you using? Do you have anything that you do that's a go to for you for anatomy wise as you're working on this? Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I get a bunch of reference basically. Once I know like the roughly the like the gender and the age and stuff, I'll go on to honestly just like Google image. Google yeah. images is fine. Sure. Um, like I'd love to have access to like 3D.sk, but. I don't know, maybe I'm a little bit too cheap with that sort of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, there's resources out there for anatomy. And I, I just try to go on Google Images and find ones that are as as little um, distorted by lighting and stuff that I can. Um, so right now I'm just trying to mess with this base mesh and try to... Oh, so you're a transpose line? You use the transpose line still more than the gizmo? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I just got used to it. Um, yeah. And then it was funny because when I started ZBrush, that was like, I, I like did not understand why they use this transpose line over like all the things that I'm used to from traditional 3D softwares. But then over time, I just got used to it. And now they have the, the gizmo and I'm like, yeah. I don't know when I'm going to use this thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the so, opposite for you. Yep. So. You can already see how quickly you're shaping her out just on this. Where you're at right now you can start seeing yeah. your thing, character coming to life a little bit yeah um i actually had started a with a sphere before this just to like test things out and i'm like well there is a major 
thing that you want to make sure you do, especially if you're like starting out with and using base meshes is like, I'll, I'll go through and just make sure I change like everything. Cause I don't want any like remnants of, and not only for the sake of, I mean, partially for sure. Like you don't want to just be using someone else's work. Also just to make sure that you, you like touch the stuff and it's like your shapes in there. So like, that's, that's one of the major things that I like to do too, because otherwise it's easy to like leave things where they were from the base mesh. And then like, if they're not important parts, like the face and eyes and like the jaw, you'll, you'll forget that you didn't even modify those bits at all. And I personally like to make sure I've touched every little bit. I mean, I know by the end of the work, I will for sure have done that anyway, but, um, it's a good I thing think, to keep I think track. Great advice. I think it's great. I get the same advice when people ask, "Hey, when should I go up in subdivision levels?" I'm like, "You should touch your whole piece before you worry about going up." Yep, exactly. Honestly, that's like my mate. the The biggest takeaway I think is just just don't ever go up in subdivisions. <laughs> it's like for a, for a while. Like I spend yeah. so much time here. You should be able to see your whole character before you go up into subdivisions. I do think there's a point where it, it can be useful when you start mm -hmm. adding wrinkles that are like character defining a bit and you end up going back and forth between them, um, between subdivisions to like polish things up. But yeah, I, I stay on sub D1 for a long, long time. And I use, I use move brush probably more than I even should, but I just like, I like just the way it works, I guess. Everyone has their style, I think. Yeah, you move. Uh, you like to move too. You're moving quite a bit here. Yep. Someone really. said they loved your infinite journeys. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you. Dude, that was an amazing contest too. Like that was insane. I, I love that. love those contests. Oh my god! I was yeah. just showing one of my colleagues. It's, that was awesome. That contest was so yep. cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Clint. Uh, Clinton Jones. The, yeah, Clinton yeah. Jones. His, yeah. his contest props are my favorite just because I love I love how he brings them all together into like one piece. Yeah. And it feels like a collaborative project, but also right. a personal project. It's great. Never ends, right? Yeah. Like the like the ball one, the marble ball one. Like it start from the top and so it just going. I put his name in the chat so you guys can look him up. He's he's got a YouTube. He holds weekly contest challenges. Was I don't that one wasn't though. That one was like I think a couple months, right? Was that one a couple months long? That one is one month also. It's one month. Too. Kind of the same okay. as the Grissetti one. Yeah, I know he does weekly ones too. Yeah, he does weekly challenges, and then I think about like once every nine months or so he does a a, a contest. I think he's planning on one for one later this year. Yeah, check it out. He gets like usually like 2,400, 2,500 people to compete. It's yeah. pretty good. And then the work is just go watch it. The one that did you only do that one? Which it was like the moving camera one, right? Where background only moving. Uh, yeah. So I did that one. I also did his, um, what is it called? Dynamic Machines Challenge. So oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the most recent one, I think, right? Um, I think Dynamic was. Machines was the one before. Infinite Journeys is the one that is the most recent. That's the most recent one. Okay. Yeah. Check it out, man. It's really cool. Yep. Will really change these shapes. Follow my own advice. It's looking like the base mesh. For this, I had started a, a sculpt from a sphere just to like, I don't know, be fresh. I was like, hey, this is just turning out pretty nice. And now I'm starting with a base mesh. And I'm like, man, I should have started with a sphere again. So you seem to be doing a lot of challenges because this was a challenge piece. Why are you why are you going into so many? What's the reason for you? doing all your challenge, the challenge um, it is like purely motivation based yeah For whatever reason oh i really like to do personal work but i always i'm so much more motivated when there's just some kind of reason for it and it gives you a time frame <laughs> like hey you have to be done at this time yeah. it forces you into a pattern of getting your work done you're yeah. finding that deadlines are a big deal for like my own motivation for sure yeah yeah it's a good point i think <clears> all everyone says that's a great way to also learn techniques and learn things real fast because you got to you're in a challenge and you only have so much time. Yep. Yeah, it's and and just knowing that other people are going to see it and like review it and see it with a critical eyes, like it kind of keeps me disciplined. I'm getting so much. What's his name? Um, Star Trek dude. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Picard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like how did it end up like that? Number one. 
number one <laughs> to the deck. Uh, James. Oh, no, not James. Now nah, I'm going like. I don't know why I'm not remembering his name. It's, you know. This is going so slow, to be honest. It's it's very different. I gotta say, sculpting on stream feels weird. Yeah, well, we're also conversating too, which is yeah, good. That, that's true. I, I never I never talk. I think to myself in sculpt, but I never talk out loud in sculpt. Thanks, Ian, for Patrick. Yes, Sir Patrick. Yes, Sir Patrick Stewart. There we go. I do see it. So probably because I have that on. Why am I why am I sculpting in wireframe? I think it's kind of helpful at the very beginning to make sure you're not horribly distorting the topology, but I would normally sculpt like this. Sink in the eyes a bit. So do you I was I was actually gonna ask you, do you, you were sculpting a lot with polyframe mode? Is that something you do do you in the beginning? you you have polyframe mode? Sometimes, mode-ing? but usually yeah. it's usually it's because I'm checking topology at some point and then I just forget to turn it back off. So normally I wouldn't do that to be honest. And here's a point. I think I do want to dabble into sub B2, but just to like establish some uh some landmarks that I want. Do a little bit of sculpting on it. Although I'll be going back down to sub D1, I think. And it's still pretty low subdivisions. <clears throat> so uh, you're doing the clay build up. Is that your go to brush for blocking out quickly? Yeah. <clears throat> That's definitely clay build up. Did I make the nose too big? That is the question. That's never too big. I don't know what I'm thinking. So you put your eyes in after you've starting to figure out more what you want to do with the eyelids and everything. Yeah, I think usually the eyelids are kind of enough to see what is happening there. And then, I mean, I'll do, definitely put them in pretty, pretty early, but for, for a bit, it's fine with just having the eyelids. I mean, you can kind of see what you're ending up with pretty yeah, quickly. You're giving yourself a lot of freedom to just go where you're seeing. Yeah, is. that's another thing. I mean, I've like some of my more recent projects, I'll have the eyelids just like as geometry, but part of the same tool, like basically with the, uh, you kind of do it with the, where's the insert? Insert sphere. Oh, well, it's gonna, I'm just gonna delete the higher subdivision. I don't really need it. Just put them in that way. Of course it is helpful to have eyes. And I'll leave them as part of the same tool so that when I'm modifying like the entire eye, they'll move with. Yeah. yeah. And like I'm not worried about them distorting the perfect sphere shape. Um because I know I'll be adding like new eyes later. Is this a wait, so was this a base mesh that you built or a base mesh that started from Lightbox? Somebody's asking. No, yeah, this is just from Lightbox. Um this is just I think this is just the female Z project. The female. Yeah, that one. And then I just chopped off the lower half. Never neglect the back of the head. I know I had her neck be way thinner. Soul shape. So, like when I'm working early, I've honestly spent a little bit too much time on the face already. I think. I mean, I'll be obviously going back to it, but early on, I'm always trying to just think like think skeleton first, skeleton and like the major uh, shapes. So 
someone's asking, what do you think is the most difficult thing to sculpt? Most <clears throat> difficult thing to sculpt. Hmm. I probably, we could probably stick with anatomy, right? Like, yeah, yeah I'm trying to think of how broad to take the question. But with anatomy, for me, I definitely struggle with like female faces, mm. which is pretty common, I think. And I can do it now, but it requires a lot of reference. I mean, which is kind of the key with everything. Like even right now, I'm not really sculpting that much of reference as much as I should. Yeah. Um, I, for now, Alex, Alex, um, Alex, I'm sorry. Andrew Cause showed me a cool way when I took one of his workshops. In the beginning of the workshop, he said, hey, write down the three parts of the anatomy you think you're really, really good at. And then write down the three that you want to get the most out of this workshop to learn. And it was interesting because by the time the end of it, some of the stuff I thought I was good at, <laughs> I wasn't good at. Yeah. The stuff I thought I needed the most on. He was like, <laughs> actually, that stuff looked better than the stuff you thought you were good at. So yeah. That, that's a good exercise, I think, I found from him. Anatomy is, I mean, there's, there's so, you can infinitely learn an anatomy, I think. Yeah. And, and to your point with that, it's like every piece flows into the next piece. And if one piece isn't right, it can make it look like another piece isn't right. Like if you don't have the shape of the skull right, but you're excellent at sculpting eyes, it's like you have this perfect eye in a sculpt in a skull that isn't a human's. So people will be like, "Why does something looks off?" But it's not. It's not the eyes, but something's off about them. I can't tell what it is. And like mm -hmm. your your brain has evolved to like learn these things like just innately, to where if you're sculpting and anything's just slightly off, your brain is like, "That's not that's not how humans are." Right. Like, I don't know why the mouth is so wide. It's also important, I think, to check from different views. Sometimes there's obvious mistakes that you're just not seeing because you're looking at it from straight on. Yeah, pesky mandible. So pesky. I mean, I know I still have a lot to learn about anatomy, too. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. You, know, you never stop learning, I think, as artists. Well, as artists, we can keep learning and learning. Mm-hmm. I think the most important thing is just always have reference on hand for whatever you're sculpting. Because otherwise you're just gonna kinda like you may be able to make something look good, but like you'll default to the same shapes that you've had success with in the past. And you, you might be able to continue to make stuff look good, but it's all kind of kinda have some similar features. And I'm sure I'm guilty of this in my own work too. Like you'll you'll kind of stick to some features that you know you always like to have in your work and if you have reference, you can like see that like, oh, some people don't have this like specific aspect of the nose bridge that I always do. So it's a great way to make sure you're still learning. Mm -hmm. like too much meat here. I always do this with when I'm making changes to like, if I know a certain area isn't looking the way I want it to, I'll like just mask the whole thing and then Usually you don't need to blur the mask on sub D1 very much, but I'll do like the going back and forth between blurring this way and that way. So I can make like subtle changes, but over like a broad area. Yeah, it's a nice way to work. You're just making some big changes with low, low, low polygons, right? That's the, that is the point of the subdivision levels too, is going down to a lower level, make large changes and having still the details on the higher level. Yep. So, so I think there's some drastic changes that could be made. Someone says it's starting to look like their neighbor. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> where, where do you live? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Reference right outside. There you go. Uh, body too, but I'm just zeroing in on this for now. Yeah, he's got some references on his other monitor that he's looking at from um, to answer your question. Someone just came in with that. He's got a little mood board. That he's These are actually the references I had when I was working on the project. Just elderly. You can see this is the smile that I borrowed a bit on the finished piece. 
I gave it a little bit more of a smile and less teeth. Um, but I'll always have stuff like this, um, like sides of the face. Sometimes reference images can be very strange, but I'm mostly looking at what I can make use of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then my mood board. This was kind of the artistic side, like what I wanted my characters to fit into. Like this is my final image. I wanted to rem be reminiscent of this kind of style. And then the rest is just kind of per, uh, like per part, like the wings. I had some bat wing reference and then some quilting was for a lot of the cloth stuff and then some necklace reference and then hands. I kind of treated separately because I like to get hands right. Hands are fun to sculpt. I should have turned off the auto save. What is the fast way to do that? Uh, in the preferences, uh, quick save. Just turn the two uh, sliders up to all the way. At least. Top two ones. Yeah, turn them all the way up. And that's that's ten hours now for auto saves. All right, stream's not that long, right? No, <laughs> I don't think you're going for ten. <laughs> I think we're good. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. Or you can hold down the escape key now, right? It'll cancel the auto saves too. Rise to be smaller. So I think I the theme know. here for everybody is he's keeping it simple, right? He's just moving along, going to all yep. the angles. It's like, here, I'll use my own. Brushes. So something, so we can look at something a little bit prettier for now. I'll go to my own work as an example. Although I did end up uh, zero meshing this eventually, but even at like, this is not too high poly, but you can see so much in it. And like this, this would be like the sub B two or three of the model that I've been working on this whole time in terms of density. It's still like, still, there's still huge polygons here. But like you can see pretty much the entire character. Yeah, you're at 60,000 just for the head right now. Yeah. So, I mean, there's kind of better examples in the process of when I was working on it. Like, this is what it looked like pretty early on. <clears throat> this is before I'd gone to sub D2. And this is kind of the first iteration of it. But, like, this is about when I would probably move to sub D2. And again, I continued exploring the character and I continued making changes. I made the nose bigger, of course. And then. I gave her that smile and the teeth and everything, but you can see like most of the kind of look of it is here in terms of like fidelity and stuff. So your your character on sub D1 should look like your character. Like this this model I'm working on, I don't think it looks very good right now, but I can tell you it's not because it's only on sub D1. <laughs> It's because I'm still exploring the forms, still trying to figure out like where the, where the character is. The anatomy still needs to be fleshed out a lot more. There's there's tons that I haven't. There's tons that's kind of inconsistent and still needs to be worked on. And all that stuff can be worked on most easily in sub D1, where the major changes can be made. I think like the biggest takeaway would be like you really should be able to see your character in sub D1. And all that's not to say, I don't think it's a mistake. If, if you like to work in like sub D2 at this point and start doing some, some form building that way, I think the more important part is that you're focused on building forms, not that it has to be sub D1 or anything like that. But I think for me personally, it's a good way to stay disciplined um, by using the subdivisions as like a guide for how far in I want my details to be going. You want to go with the ETF, yeah, but so I'll uh start going up a bit, maybe though, just to keep things moving. But even on sub D like two and probably three, I'd be still working on anatomical stuff. Like you really want to be able to see the I mean, it depends on kind of your character's 
what shape they're in, but you could always see the, the shape of the person's skull. Almost no matter what their like body fat percentage is or anything like that, their gender, you can kind of always see where the skull is if you're looking for the bony landmarks. And so it's a good thing to think about when you're sculpting a face is what does the skull look like under the skin? Parts of parts where fleshy bits are on top of the skull and, and fat pools up and things like that, but yeah, especially when we get a little older, you'll see more of our skull, right? Because aging process and yeah. I'd I'd really exaggerated forms in the final sculpt, like you can see that philosophy pretty clearly, and then I really sunk in the cheeks. And it's cool. Yeah, I always big make ear, sure. getting the ears bigger too, which makes <laughs> yeah. yeah, very nice. So I'll try to kind of uh, speed up through some area and just kind of show how I do some more wrinkling and detailing because I'm sure most people get the point of how I like to work. But the higher you go, and so I'm, I'm subdividing, by the way, if you can't tell. Um, so now I'm back up, or I'm up to like four, and this would be pretty far in. I'd be, I'd have the character be almost done by now. I'd probably have worked on the cloth and everything at this point. Um, <clears throat> but eventually, when I do get to like wrinkling and stuff, I just use damp standard for the most part. Things like crow's feet. And I'll usually have a pretty low uh, intensity for almost everything I do, even like clay buildup. My intensity will be super low. Um, clay buildup is definitely my preferred form building brush. You can even do like wrinkles and things with them. You can kind of use the line that it creates naturally to kind of guide some wrinkles as you work. Even five feels like too much intensity. You're pretty much for your wrinkles, Damien standard and clay buildup for the most part. Uh, yep. Just doing the sculpting, old school way. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't really consider myself a like super technical user of ZBrush. I mean, I've I've learned. Um, I try to like dabble in at least knowing a bit about all the technologies and stuff like Nano Mesh and things like that, just to make sure I can make use of them when I have to. Uh, like I'll do the like little tutorial videos that ZBrush comes out with on them. Uh, cause it's, it's, it's important, I think, to build your tool set and know what you can do. Should you, should the need ever arise to do it? But I don't like, I don't use those things too often for like every project, but I knew for like the necklace on this character, which I'll probably get to pretty soon. The, um, <clears throat> I knew I could make use of like just insert meshes and, and nano mesh to like test things out. So, um, Having knowledge that there were at least tools that I could use made 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 me have like a workflow already established for getting those things started. Yeah, for wrinkles and things, I'll use just plain old clay build clay build. I think I'm having some intersecting geometry affects my brushing here. <clears throat> And you're using a tablet, right? Yep, just a plain old tablet. I have a, uh, actually from this contest, I won a little display tablet, like a Cintiq style thing, but I yeah. can't get used to it. Oh no? I've, I've used it and I could see like the, the potential in it helping a lot. And then I just go back to using my tablet. I think I do how need big, to give how it big a- How was it? How big was the one you won? Do you know? It's, um, 
Well, I'm on it right now. I don't know how big this is. It's a fair size. Yeah. It's like, um, might be like 19 21. inches or something. 21, 21 maybe. Inches. It might be 21. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. I know I've become a big, big, yeah, uh, Cintiq kind of guy because when my mine went down for a while and I was back on the tablet, it really threw me for a loop for some stuff. So I, I really like having drawing right on the screen for me. That's become something that I like to do. I think I need to like sit down and treat it as practice to like learn how to get used to it. Yeah. Because yeah. I do. It was like when I was sculpting with it, I could feel like the the response just being a little bit better than using a Wacom yeah. tablet, just a normal yeah. tablet. So I think yeah, I, I need to just get a little disciplined with it. I like it for nice, consistent lines. Like if you're going to go around that brow and you just want to go around, the, you're actually drawing right on the brow, right? So I find yeah. that for me uh, easier to do yeah. than trying to do tablet to look at the screen. Yeah. Are you self-taught or did you do any mentorships? Um, I went to school for VFX and animation in Chicago. It was a two year like trade school. So I got an associates. Um, so that was like my foundation of knowledge, but I feel like in what I've learned since then, it's like in two years, you can only really scratch the very surface, but mm -hmm. I, I do think of it as my foundation of knowledge. And then from then on out, it's like I've, I worked in the industry. Uh, I worked at NetherRealm Studios <clears throat> on Mortal Kombat right out of school, which was amazing. And that was, I think, like really my foundation of learning how to work. Because that was, I was, it was just such a huge workload. And I was just sitting there making props day after day. And it's just constantly making assets. Yeah. <clears throat> but a lot of that, like the learning aspect of that is just like talking with my peers and like, how do you do this? How do you do that? A collaborative working environment. Right. So. Yeah, I think it's a good point. You keep, like you said earlier, you keep learning. And you, you never can stop learning. So you just, after school, kept going at it. Yeah. So I don't know. This is a kind of how I would do wrinkling. And I'd be, Again, paying attention with my reference, seeing where wrinkles form, where I can not really worry about it so much, where's a good idea to like, I don't know, you want to make sure all these details, always go back to your reference and make sure you're not making things up. Because that's how you run into like the, why doesn't this look quite right? I'm not sure. It has wrinkles. It, it, it should be realistic. Is that when you go look at references? Uh, mostly is when you're starting to see something wrong, you'll look back at the reference? Or are you a constant yeah. look at reference while you're sculpting? Uh, it's both. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely usually more disciplined than I am right now because I'm trying to focus on all these things. But yeah, always look at reference while you're sculpting. Uh, I, I do think there's, I mean, you want to be creative too. So you want to be able to like, if you see ways to explore the character, obviously none of my references have a nose this big. So I have to adjust for that. And like, how do, how do I change it to make sense using the knowledge that I have of anatomy? Um, but you still want to use reference as like a basis for, for that kind of improvisation. But then, but then yet, as you're saying, especially when <clears throat> like something's not right, if you're like, well, I don't like the nose bridge, something is weird here. It's like, you can, you can go in here and be like, all right, uh, I don't know, just do something and maybe it'll look better. But normally in that situation, you go to reference and either the ones that you have, see what the nose bridges are and try to analyze the form. Like, how is it actually shaped? Try to understand the shape that's happening and mimic that in 3D. Because um, that, that's really the way to, to get things to look right. If you're improvising too much, then, um, I mean, it'll look how only as good as your own knowledge is of, of whatever it is you're sculpting. But looking at reference, you can learn and improve. Yeah, I think it becomes muscle memory for you probably, right? You've done so many heads and then you start understanding the anatomy even more. So you get yep. a little bit more muscle build, memory sculpting. Yeah, you get like a mental library. Yeah. <clears throat> but that was kind of what I was alluding to before too, is I try not to too much rely on the mental library, at least my own. It's like, I know I have weak spots mm -hmm. 
it's like the very fact that I know that I still struggle with like even a female face means that there's some fundamentals that I don't understand yet about like the human form and the differences between a male and female face, which just knowing that it's like, okay, so if I ever do want to do projects with female faces, which I do intentionally do a lot just to get better, I make sure that I'm doing these things with reference and just like loading up so I can learn like, all right, what are the shapes that I have to look after? What are the habits that I have that, that I keep doing to my models to make them look more masculine and I can adjust from there. And like, what is this jaw? So just by like focusing on those things, um, I've learned over time and I've gotten better. And now I know that like, if I, if I prepare enough for a project that is out of my comfort zone, I can make it just fine. But it is important to understand your weaknesses too. So when it comes for you for learning, do you find it more useful to start with the thing, say the hands, and you start studying from scratch or study from a base mesh? Um, I think there's definitely value in starting from scratch. Like, especially if you're starting off, um, cause, cause there's even like a hand as simple as this, there's a pretty solid foundation of knowledge here. Like obviously the fingers are super smooth cause it's from a base mesh and it's been subdivided and things like that. But like, there's a lot of, you can see the bone, the knuckles and things like that. And if you're starting with this and you're kind of new to sculpting or anatomy, then you'll kind of not understand why those shapes exist. And you'll already be, it's kind of like skipping a step. And it's like the most foundational step. So I would say from learn for learning, like start everything from from scratch, probably scratch. For, for a purely learning situation. Yeah, I would say so. Cool. Or, or a base mesh that's like really simple, like four polygons for fingers. Yeah, uh, something like that. But like for a hand like this, you can already see so much shape that's already there that you would want to learn how to sculpt yourself. I guess that that is something that I think is an adjustment that is naturally made with experience that for me, it's more of a technical thing that I want to start with a base mesh because I already know where I'm going to want the fingers and things like that. And having the topology be correct really helps with sculpting. Like I know I'm going to want wrinkles on the knuckles and things like that. So the, the topology is there for, I mean, if also if I want to rotate the finger, and then I know there's topology for, you know, the knuckle still has edges and things like that to sculpt on. Whereas if I was <clears throat> doing it from scratch, I'd have to be kind of zero meshing and dyna meshing to make sure I always have that fidelity. But I mean, that's also a valid way to do things, just dyna meshing. And you know, I've over time, I guess, developed a personal preference, but I swap around a lot too. Like the great thing about ZBrush and DynaMesh and ZeroMesh is you really don't have to worry about it too much unless you're making a, a mesh for game or you want like really, unless you have a reason for wanting to have super clean topology and UVs and all that, you can pretty much sculpt anything with just DynaMesh and ZeroMesh. Uh, maybe I've spent enough time on scale. And then I'll also use like alphas and stuff for more fine detailing. Do you have your own set? Of, so you have your own set of alphas that you've made? Uh, no, I've, I've, this set is um, <clears throat> by Raphael Souza. And I found it years ago. And it's been pretty helpful. I'll usually, usually use it for most of my faces, but I, I also have a pack from Jay Hill who has a YouTube channel that is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's a great guy. Great artist. He's really good. So I've, I bought his uh, texturing pack and skin alpha pack. And those, those are great for like poor details and things like that. But this is kind of like a, um, those are huge, but it looks like in the image he's telling you where to actually apply this. Yeah. Is that what he's telling you in that image in the thumbnail? Yeah, the it process? seems like yeah. it. I mean, yeah. I, I noticed that when I was starting to use them too. And it's they're pretty helpful guidelines. 
Um, yeah, it's a great idea. That's a great idea. Yep. So they have like compressed pores. Yeah. Um, yeah, the pores on our noses are different size than the pores, say, on you know our cheek. You know, nose yeah. doesn't move as much as our mouth's moving. Uh, I've had varying degrees of success with like each of these. Sometimes I end up using uh, some for areas that aren't necessarily highlighted in the little image. Mm -hmm. um, and then like the wrinkles are, oh, it's on symmetry now. They're like really straight to where, right? You can kind of see that like hashed lines, which isn't really ideal. So sometimes I have to like fudge with them a little bit to get them to look the way I want. But I do think it's a pretty nice sort of a, uh, simplified brush set for skin alpha yeah let me see if i can find them um, what is that on gumroad do you remember do you remember um, no if you type in Rafael souza i kind of made a little uh, thing to, of resources that i thought i might mention so this one here uh you'll probably find it with the google search of Rafael yeah. souza skin alpha brush pack um, it's pretty old too Honestly, there may be better ones out there by now. I remember I found this one a while ago, and I've always kind of held on to it because I find it kind of useful. I think I found it. They were free. Yep, and it was free. Yeah, I found it. Yeah, I found at least. Yeah, yep. Yeah, these are them. Okay, I found it. Here, I'll put it in the chat for you all. Um, there you go. And they still are free. So, yeah. I'm not making the greatest looking person, but you can see my workflow. That's the important part, I think. <laughs> Again, you're also talking and sculpting. So <laughs> you this thing to I do. know. I got. I got to be easy on myself. Easy. It's not easy. Yep. So, but I do want to make sure I cover everything. Um, there's another little trick that I like to do, mostly on the body. When I'm at a point where I'm like kind of like at this situation where I have a lot, some of the major wrinkles established and I have the forms established and I want to preview what skin uh, might look like. I have a combination of uh, noise modifiers that I think is does a pretty decent job of doing really quick skin. Is the, oh, it's on my other monitor. I use the Vernoy oh, yeah. noise plugin. Mm -hmm. And then let's see if I can do this. I always struggle with like scale of the, I got to start with no basic noise. There it is. So this is pretty good on its own of just like kind of giving that illusion, but then mixing basic noise, you can kind of get some like overall roughness out of it too. So I'll combine the roughness of the Make it stronger. A little more roughness. So you're using this as just your overall base skin. Yeah. Um, uh, like I'm, I may not even use it as a final anything, mm -hmm. but it's a really like, I mean, what it takes two minutes yeah. to like preview skin. See so, you now it's like, it helps to like, sometimes it's hard to tell at a certain point if how much skin texture is like the problem with it not looking quite right. So I like to just throw this on as a way of like, what is it going to look like when I get a decent material on there? Mm -hmm. I can kind of preview it that way. So I can just turn it off. I usually don't sculpt with it on though. Cause you don't want to, it can be deceiving. Like it's detailed. It's not there yet. And, um, not necessarily uh, helpful to sculpt when when it's already it's kind of modifying the mesh on top of your sculpt so it's kind of you're seeing a combination of a few things happening or is sculpting on its own it's a little it's a little more accurate to your actual model right that's a great little tip though that's a good way to use surface noise yeah and then I might apply it later but I usually don't apply surface noise unless I'm like basically done and there's a reason to actually apply it for baking eventually and stuff anyway. Um, I think that covers most of the techniques I use. Oh, and you can see this is where I use like J Hills. 
has some great pore brushes. Like he went in and like sculpted pores and then got like really high resolution maps off of them. Um, and that's what I used for the nose. So he has a great uh, sculpting or uh, skin texture pack that I think is, I forgot how much it costs, like 10, 15 bucks. Let me see. I'll see if I'll get that too. They can have that as well. He has some great uh, alphas that I use for noise as well. Okay, I've got his store. There you go. I'll put that into the chat for you all as well. There's Jay Hill's store. And he's. I mean, if you want to learn more about anatomy and things like that, he's a fantastic YouTube channel and he does a lot of uh, face work and he talks a lot about the importance of working from reference and a lot of the same things that I've touched on. Where was your final render done again for this? Uh, Blender. Okay. It was one of my first projects that I finalized in Blender. So I'd just gotten comfortable with it. So I would say that is kind of my, my overall workflow is I stay low subdivision. Oh, the hands are a good example. Miss. Like you can already see so much of the detail of the hands, even on such low polygon count. It's like ideally you get to this point with a model before you start subdividing and adding in details. Cause it'll just make things faster and easier. To get used to making those major changes on the lower sub B. Anyway, I've talked about that enough, I think. So maybe I'll touch on the, the necklace. So I'll first go to the jewelry. Um, and first thing I did was try to find reference of some necklaces that I liked. Um, so this is my little necklace section. I really liked these, and you can probably see the resemblance, especially if how they link, and these little, like, these two circles that kind of match on the individual pieces. Uh, and the, the gems. And this is mostly made out of, I mean, I can't really tell. It's a pretty low-res image, but they're kind of flat-ish pieces of metal which I could really use to my favor and like trying to recreate something like that. So um, let me go to my project and my tool. I separated all this out into, that's for the other necklace, into another Z tool, just to kind of keep working on it simple. Here's this one. So these are kind of the pieces for that. And these are like way higher res than they need to be. And then these, I would just create these, which I'll go over that in a bit. But once I was done, I would just make insert meshes out of them. Uh, current mesh. Oh. And I think, oh, that's just the tool. So I'd have to merge the tool. That's what I did, right? And then I would create like a really simple piece of geometry like this around the character that's like roughly um, framing the neck in the way that I wanted the necklace to. And you could just go in and oh, I need to make this into a, it's a nano mesh brush, right? Yep. 
Yeah. Or it's an insert mesh brush. You want to make it a nano. Yeah. It's too small. I think I was going into the actual settings where you could change the scale. Mm -hmm. Size. Yeah. And then that's just on one polygon. When I was like testing it, you could do the all polygons. It's probably a pretty dense scene. Um, one thing I was looking for is I think I had one that was like too dense like this. <clears throat> is there a way to have nano mesh do every other polygon? Uh, yeah, you could do it by polygroup. So you could use the uh, Zmaller option to do checkered. And then it'll automatically do every other polygroup for you. And then you would just say one polygroup. So it's just, it's just stay in the nano brush you're at. And then go over face and switch oh, gotcha. to polygroup. And then switch to checkered on the bottom in the uh, action targets and then do like a poly loop probably yeah poly loop, poly group, yep. and then just click in the direction you want there you go oh, cool and then and then now just go back to your nano mode right over your face yep insert nano mesh go back to that at the top <clears throat> up higher yeah. there you go oh, you're oh, on the right way. Nano there mesh. you go Got it. and then switch to poly group all poly i'll go back all. now and do poly group all there you go Sweet. That's there you awesome. go. Yeah, because now I can get the size. And then looks like they're a bit scattered. I can do the uh, align edge. Should make them all. So now I had this problem when I was working on it. I ended up having to split it into two separate tools because right now they're all going the same direction. Um, and in my final one, like all the pieces are facing. I need to get rid of all the noise. <clears throat> like right now, all the necklace pieces are all facing the same way. Uh, and in my final piece, I have some like this way is right side up, and this, this way they're going upside down. But anyway, that's kind of like the rough workflow. And then by the end, I would uh, like manually have to connect these things. I mean, there's really no way to automate having this link connect to here. If it was just like one circular link, it's probably doable. But having all these links like come together, that I actually went through and did manually, which was a bit of work, but it wasn't too bad at the end of the day. And these gems are actually just literally uh, decimated meshes. Oh, you just took a sphere and just decimated it down. Yep. Yeah. And it was initially just like just to get it done really quick so I could kind of right. pre-viz how the thing was going to look and ended up kind of working. Like even the uh, even the big gem at the end, you can see it's just like the same decimated sphere and I just like pulled down this group of polygons. It's like, yeah, that's a gem. Looks good to me. I, yeah, probably people didn't even realize when they, you should had your final render, right? It looks good. Yeah, I mean, so much of a gem is how it reflects light and everything. And I knew that was all going to be in the materials once I got to material setup and all that in Blender. And it looks like you, so you sculpted also on top of the, the pieces when you got in there to do a little, yeah. Or is that just yeah. a noise? Or were you just applying a noise across everything? Yeah, that was a noise, I think. Uh, yeah, it was just surface noise. And I think I used one of the like noisemaker presets, maybe this one. Oh yeah. With some modification. <clears throat> I was I remember this was like a few days before contest was done. I'd actually changed the entire design of the collar at some point. Like I'm going through my progress images. For a while I had this sort of a collar. Uh-huh. And <clears throat> it was really limiting my design space because like the final image is kind of like it cuts off like right about there and the collar was basically taking up all this room that I wanted to add so much more detail and it was hard to fit a necklace like over the collar so I ended up changing it um, right about here to this like I don't know kind of more interesting I don't even know what I would call it um, but this this allowed me all this like space to like add jewelry and necklaces and that's I had a few days left, I think, to like figure out how that was all going to work. So it was some rushed elements to the jewelry making for sure. But here you can actually see like this is about where the step is that I was just kind of working on. 
um, or even upside down like I just showed. And then, uh, but I kind of refined that technique and by now I'm just having fun with it. I added this necklace and I made this whole like major piece custom, but in the same way. And then I have this like second necklace going on over on top of it. And it basically uses the same technique of uh, polygons. And then you can see there's kind of like chains, chain links that link together. I ended up doing this one like link by link because I wanted that like variety of chain links instead of just the same ones repeating. But I mean, this kind of goes back to design, which I think, I mean, I'm pretty happy with what I ended up with in the final entry. And why is it not moving over here? So much of it is stuff that could have looked a lot worse, but I'm always trying to reassess the image and find out what I need to change to get a better look out of it. I mean, that's kind of why I changed the collar is because I had this render, but it had the old coll collar and I like could see so much room for improvement. I like had the idea of having jewelry added and like the mental image of how that looked was so much better than what I was looking at. So like, all right, let's cut our losses with the thing that we already made, make a new collar, change it. It's going to look better. I was confident that it would look better. So I just went through and redid it. She was also initially going to have a staff. You can kind of see her pose is still there because I didn't change the pose or the cloth simulation for her staff that used to be there. But it was kind of pulling the camera away from the image and not focusing on the stuff that I liked. So I ended up having her, leaving her hand in the same pose, but not including the staff. And then I kind of did this like prayer beads thing, which ended up, I think, looking cooler anyway. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to making like, if you're making something for a single image, it's really important to constantly reassess the thing that you're making. And if it's, sometimes you have to cut your losses on things that you've already made. Like I spent a day or two making this staff look awesome. And then I saw it in the final image and I was like, eh, it's, not, not, it's not quite not working for me. So I just deleted the whole thing. Where did you get the hat idea? Cause I thought you looks like you changed the hat to in some of the images you were cycling through. Where did you get yeah, the, final the hat concept? Um, <clears throat> The hat concept, I had like this, it was like an anime I used to watch that had a, kind of a similar hat. It's called Bleach. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have watched it. Um, but one of the one of the dudes in this anime had a hat that was like this, where it has like these this one piece that kind of wraps around it and points the same direction. And I just thought that was an awesome design element that has just been in, been in my head for since I watched that show so long ago. Right. I was like, I'm going to do, it was an interesting hat. I was just thinking of interesting hats. So... Um, this looks nothing like it, but it was like my memory of the, just this wrapped around cloth. And then that, that was the foundation of the design. And then I wanted a really fun pattern of some sort. And again, I'm just like, what's, I don't know, what's going to look good a, across this, uh, flat plane here. I can bring up the actual thing. And I looked up quilting. So I kind of have a quilting pattern. Did you sculpt that by hand or that's an that's an image or you started from? Um, this is cloth simulation. This, oh, okay. The actual whole thing was uh, done in cloth simulation. Like this is a little screenshot from Marvelous Designer. Mm -hmm. I'd actually done all the, like these are the seams. So like this type of stuff, I really like doing as much cloth as I possibly can in cloth simulation. It's, it's kind of hard to beat cloth simulation. Uh, in terms of realism, I do think you always want to sculpt on top of it to get it to look to actually look right. Uh, but that's always my foundation is doing as much cloth simulation for any cloth piece as I can if I'm working on something realistic. And I mean, I've gotten better at sculpting cloth freehand over time, but it's it's still like at this point it's faster to do simulations and combining simulations with sculpting freehand on top, I think is like the the best spot to be with getting good looking clothing. And then for your final render, do you use, did you use displacement maps and normal maps or did you just decimate it down and then take it out? I used, I used normal maps. I didn't use displacement mostly for time reasons. Uh, they would have helped, but uh, I, I use zero mesh for a lot of the actual final low res. I guess it's more of a medium res. Mm -hmm. But I think like the uh, 
the head here is this was my actual final mesh. So it's probably not UV'd inside ZBrush, but oh, it is. Let's see if this crashes my machine. Oh, it has layers, right? Does it have layers? No, uh, you might be showing, are you sure you're showing everything? You might be hiding a portion. Oh, check that out. Oh, there you go. There we go. Let's see. Right, still is. Yeah, there's a layer in there. There you go. I wonder if I UV'd this in. Okay, I think I UV'd it in another software, but anyway, there it is. <laughs> yeah, this is my actual final mesh. So this is what I ended up baking maps onto from the. What about virus. the necklace? Did you did normal maps on that too, or did you just decimate because it's hard edge? That was a decimation. Yeah. You just decimated. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they're asking, so I just wanted to. Oh, cool. Yeah. For them. Yeah. So the necklace is decimated, um, and then like that comes down to whether or not I thought I was going to need a material, uh, either like custom texture maps basically for an asset, which I think was just the face um, and some parts of cloth, like this has a UV map and I baked down all the like seam details because I had little seam sculpted in. Oh yeah. Well, not sculpted in, but I, I used a script that I made for Blender to get like a bunch of seams along the, the Marvelous Designer seams. So all that I baked down onto a mesh um, but mostly if I could get away with just decimating and then throwing on some kind of procedural material, that's what I did. Like the earrings are the same way. I'll just decimated. Is that a person in the earring? Can you go closer? To uh, that? It's kind of like a, it's like a person kind of oh, yeah. see death. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. It could have been better, but I was like having fun with it and no, it works. I saw it. I thought so it worked. It looks good. It looked cool. I'm glad you recognized. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those. I just so wanted the little details will stand out and stuff. Yeah, like that I mind. wanted to cram as much detail as possible for it. So everything I made, I was like, if I could hide in some kind of some fun detail. Yeah, and again, he did this in spare time at night after working eight, ten hour probably days, right? So in one month, four weeks. Yeah, it's like four to eight hour days. I'll be honest. Oh yeah, <laughs> but it, it was it was a lot of work. This is, I think I estimated like a, that it was like a 90 to 100 hour project, probably. Oh, when you figure out the hours. Yeah. I remember I roughly figured it out back when I was like, I think it, it, might, it might have been on the submission form. Like, how many hours do you, oh, you have to put? On? You had to put in the submission form how many, how long you worked on it? Um, well, I think it was more out of like interest. Like, uh, I don't know if Grissetti's actually did that. <clears throat> I know for the Clint, Clinton Jones challenge, he he has he asked the submitters to put their hours because he ends up tallying them up and saying like, "This uh, was like 18 years of collaborative effort," which is technically right, true. Yeah, yeah, he puts on the beginning of his videos. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's like crazy to think about. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> Especially so, when you look back on a work and you're like, "Oh man, <laughs> I worked yeah. on that for hours." Um, and these, I mean, on a contest like this where I have time constraints, I'm also thinking when it comes to even design, like making sure the design elements that I'm trying to create are not going to take forever or that I have some kind of workflow in mind. So part of the reason why I like this style of necklace is because it was mostly made of flat pieces. So I could kind of literally start with a flat plane and just like draw out the shape. <clears throat> so that's like how I made the, the major necklace pieces. It was literally like sculpting or not even sculpting. I would just mask out something like this onto a flat plane. <clears throat> Again, I'm always forgetting to turn off wireframe. And then just, I don't know, something like that. Mm -hmm. Just make a poly group. And then, 
than to the rest. Yeah. So do I, yeah, I'll end up having to. This is where I always, if I end up doing a lot of this stuff, I'll make like a U, little like UI uh, section that just has the things that I need. I'm sometimes a little bit too lazy with keeping everything default. Um, but yeah, I'll go from here and I'll see Ramesh and that might be too. Oh, fun thing. So this always happens with zero mesh. <clears throat> and I don't know if there's like a, a button fix for it, but I found that panel loops ends up kind of solving that issue almost as yeah, a side it's effect. Probably um, the topology along the edges. Yeah. So uneven and then crazy. So <clears throat> the remesher is trying to figure it out. Yeah. Um, and I've noticed that with anything that's like spiky too, like if this came to more of a point, it would always do something like that. And sometimes I really need it to not do that. And it was some. It was giving me frustration. And then there's probably several ways to fix it. But sure. a lot of the times, I already have the asset, and I'm already like in ZBrush working on it. And I found out that panel loops will like, especially if you add a little bit of polish, it will create enough of a difference in the edge geometry that it helps uh, zero mesh solve for that kind of thing. So let's see if it works here. No, I just panel loops it, and then. Uh, reselect or re isolated just that same area, and then I'll go and delete the geometry I've hidden again. Um, I'm lost. There we go. Modify topology. There you go. Yeah, there's multiple ways to go about this. And then try to see if zero mesh does better this time. Yeah, so now it's much better. So, and this is basically the foundation of how I would make the piece. And then I would make or use panel loops. This time I'll get rid of the polish. And a uh, much thicker one loop. It's a little bit of a jagged edge. Yeah, no bevel. And then I love having the, the loop there be its own poly group. Oh, no, I forgot I had that nano mesh still going. But that didn't crash my whole system. Um, then I can go and like extrude this poly loop or poly group. Where's my poly group? Right, the right poly group all. Yep. No. Yeah, there you go. And uh, this is basically how I did the jewelry. I would just do like a little edge like that. Let's move that out. I see little how that's, that's the foundation. And then I would just go and uh, draw like back on top of this to create the second layer of detail. And this is like where the gem would be. Really quick lines, but idea. I would probably want to duplicate it. Um, but I mean, you can see the resemblance. Second piece was made basically using the same workflow and just put right on top of this piece. And then this is just the whole necklace. It's just like a series of that same technique repeated. It's stacked meshes that you're doing. Yep. And again, this is just a decimated sphere. Nice. So getting things done quickly was definitely a, on my mind through a lot of the project. Yeah, and doing challenges, that's one of the nice things that really pushes you to see what you can come up with in that short period of time. Yeah. That's another, I've, I realize that every time I do a project, I learn so much too. Yeah. Because along those same lines, you also learn what's important and what's not. So not only like you learn where to spend your time on details. Like sure you can add it's great to be able to add details anywhere, but working on projects, especially with a final image that is one camera, you learn like where it's important, where your eye's gonna be drawn to and where details are necessary to be added. Yeah, I don't know what the staff was, but I think you know those beads. Like you're saying, it's a, uh, a rest who's turning the eye and 
into the hand, which then's going up to the head and coming down your, your neck. Yeah. yeah. That was, that was really a yeah. nice, uh, result of the change too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I do think that was, if there's anything I learned on this project specifically, it's that like it, it pays off so much to, to not be afraid to cut your losses with certain elements that you've made. Cause I mean, I, I always feel like there's so many artists that are insane sculptors. Like I see the Grissettis and all them and they can like live sculpt and they're like, wow, they're just making art immediately. It's like mm -hmm. effortless. And I know I've gotten better and I'm sure a lot of people like are impressed by me sculpting. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but I always feel like there's always people so much better than me still. But like, if you can like work with the talent that you have and you can like see your image and, and think of the adjustments that you know you need to make spending the time to like, I don't know, develop the, like knowing what you need to improve. You can, you can get really fast or re really far, really fast by just like kind of knowing, I don't know, knowing when to cut your losses, I guess. I don't know how to describe what I'm trying to convey, but like the staff was such a big part of, of yeah. the whole thing. It's like, you know, almost Bob Ross has a little, you know, happy little accident yeah. happening, yeah. right? You know, you thought the staff would be good when you put it in, then it's just not <clears throat> composition wise working for you. Yep. Yeah. So it's important to be able to go and like see the final image and just see yeah. what's working, what's not, and just objectively analyze it and be like, if a piece isn't working, just get rid of it and make something different. And yeah, I don't think any of us would even know that you originally wanted a staff. It looks yeah. like, you know, that was your original pose you were going for. And I think that's a good point. Art is a little bit of discovery and a journey, too, for this. So you don't always have to be, this is the, going to be the way. There's sometimes things will change. Yeah. That's what I like about art books. I love buying art books still and just seeing the process of everyone's processes and art itself. Especially like movie ones and things like that. Yeah. You can learn a lot just by flicking through those. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to see if I can find an image of that staff somewhere maybe oh yeah and it's not a big deal you lost a day that's about it yeah which is it's a lot in contest time but it's like i had the whole thing done it's like it looked better without it so right <clears throat> well, you did get third so it's a great piece yeah i don't know how many people he ended up getting i know he got a lot to compete too yep yeah he's got a lot of reach are you in another, uh, are you, you got your next eyed, uh, competition that you're doing? Um, I don't have one right now. I've got a little bit of actual work to do, which is good right now. Um, uh, I think Clint is going to have another challenge that I'm sure I'll be participating in some degree. I don't know if I'll have enough time is the one I just finished, but, um, I'll be keeping an eye out. It's hard to know. Like the right challenge has to come by for me to want to do it. But I've been lucky in that a lot of the challenges coming up, Grissetti's was super, I've always followed him. So I was always motivated by just like, oh, sweet, I can participate. Maybe he'll notice me. <laughs> and then Clint's, I just love his prompts. Like I love the the way he does his challenges, the community building and everything. It's fun to be a part of. So um, we'll see which which contest catches my eye next. But I, right. I, think I, I think I'll keep doing them and... Well, I think of anything that anyone's taken away, how much you're learning from these competitions for you, right? It's, it's a big also, not just doing the skulls, but a learning process as well. Techniques. Yeah, definitely. Because I do think I've had a spike in quality, like seeing my, for myself, my own work, I think, I think has improved a lot, like over the last couple of years, because I've been doing this stuff for about 10 years and I've always progressively gotten better, but, mm -hmm. um, this, the progress wasn't as fast as I'd have liked it to be. And I came to a point maybe a few years ago or a couple of years ago where I like just wanted to really challenge myself in whatever way I could find. And then contest ended up just being such a great way for me to do it. It channels a lot of my own personal, like I'm naturally competitive. So I am so driven during these things and it feels like I'm utilizing my own expertise. So they just really work for me in terms of a learning tool. Yeah. Well, I think you got through everything you wanted to share with them, right? I'm thinking uh, more or less. Yeah. I mean, I'm willing to. You showed your jewelry. Have more you know. Questions and anything like that. I can. Yeah. If there's any other them. questions, I've been throwing them at you as from the chat as we've gone along here. But if people have questions too that they still want to ask, put them in the, the chat there as well. We'll make sure 
we can send them Alex's way. But you know, congratulations too again, third place, and and thank you again for being a part of the stream and sharing. Oh, they want to know what computer are you using? Oh, um, I built it like four years ago. I have a 1080 Ti as my graphics card, and then everything else, I don't remember to be honest. Um, it's not super impressive though, uh, by today's standards. I, I've not been able to get a crazy graphics card. They're they're too expensive right now. <laughs> yeah. It's like impossible, but uh, yeah. So besides Rafael Garcetti's challenge and Clinton's uh, Jones's challenges, where else are you finding challenges that you're participating in? Um, honestly, those kind of popped up by coincidence. Like I was following those people already. And then when I found out they were making challenges, um, that's that's how I found them. So I don't even know where I would look. I used to go on... I used to do ones from like ArtStation or uh, Polycount. Polycount used uh -huh. to have character art challenges. Yeah. I don't know if they're still doing that, um, but I would join smaller ones so so often back in the day, like years ago, when I was like in school or I guess right out of school more often. Yeah. Um, but now I'm a little bit more picky. I like to I like to have a certain amount of time. I like to I have to like the prompt for me to really want to commit the time to it because I know I'm going to be spending a month of like my life on it. So I'm a little bit picky now. So I don't know how I would find new challenges if I was really seeking them. Um, but challenges for the sake of challenges, I'm sure there's more coming out like all the time. Art Station, I try to keep track of what they're doing, but I don't see them too often for character art specifically. Um, but they they do things now and then too. How did you make the wing membrane? Oh, oh, that's a good question. I didn't really. I mean, it isn't too crazy, but I have. I think this project kind of illustrates it a bit. I have, this is kind of a blockout phase still, but I basically had the the fleshy part separate for a while, and then I had this as just a super thin mesh that I could adjust. Um, separately and then I basically got them to an almost finished state like the anatomy would have been blocked in you can see knuckles and wrinkles even uh, and I would still keep them separate and then towards the end I would finally I did panel loops on this um, to get just the thickness and I would make sure it was at least thick enough to where it wouldn't like intersect with itself in some areas um, so I don't know how thick they ended up being, but probably a little more than that. And then I would finally combine them, zero mesh it, or dyna mesh it to actually merge the meshes together and then zero mesh it. Um, maybe I can quickly demo that. Right. So you just started with a simple, simple plane then, uh, and then put the thickness on it later. Yeah. But keep it thin so you can make large adjustments and have to worry about geometry overlapping. Yes. Yeah. Because there's, I mean, I sure that's why the person's asking it's if you're, if you have this all as one mesh and you're trying to like sculpt on it, you're going to run into so many issues with geometry intersecting and that sort of thing, which is what I anticipated. I was like, that's going to be a nightmare. So I worked on the membrane separately and then attached it later. Um, so, yeah, I, I do the same for me too. I do for clothing. I stick with thin, thin planes and then mm -hmm. figure it out. Yeah, this is actually pretty much the same process I use for when I import clothing, uh, the simulated stuff. It'll be completely flat, and then I add thickness later with panel loops. Uh, so now they're the same image or the same uh, mesh. Intersect a little bit better there. And then you can still touch them up separately at this point before kind of finalizing it. And yeah, I would just dynamesh it, whatever resolution makes sense. It's obviously too low. I might have had to like scale it up to even get the resolution. But... It could have overlapping. Yeah, I think I made it too thin, but that's, yeah, that's when you see that switch why... cheese, that's usually yep. you're breaking a rule. It's not watertight at some points. Yeah, so uh, I think I had a thicker membrane in the end. I bet I could go back and see that it's considerably thicker. Yeah. So that was the thickness about that ended up being, but you can kind of see the workflow at least. All right. How do you break apart learning different aspects 
of the workflow, like sculpting faces, fabric, and then technical stuff. That was honestly just over time, because faces and anatomy is always what I kind of gravitated towards uh, learning and everything. I always wanted to be a character artist, so I always was like, sculpting faces, doing stuff like that. That was probably the first thing I learned. Um, and then over time, I just kind of realized where my weak points were and what I needed to learn. It's like everything I learned because I needed to at some point. So with cloth, I, I saw cloth simulations being used even in video games uh, at some point. And I was like, okay, I really need to learn how to use Marvelous Designer and then that's when I learned Marvelous Designer to improve my character art. Um, and I've been doing that for years now. So I've kind of developed a workflow for Marvelous and importing it into ZBrush. And uh, yeah, I kind of learn things as they become relevant to what I'm working on, which is kind of a, has just come with time and like just different projects require different things. And you can never really say like, I don't know, to like a client, like, sorry, I don't, I don't do jewelry on my characters if they want a character with jewelry so you take the project like that and you learn how to make jewelry so it's kind of just been like there's so many resources online with youtube and just whatever to to learn individual parts so i'll usually like once it becomes relevant to me and once i need to learn it i'll find resources youtube tutorials anything like that just to and then just do it for myself and see if i'm successful or not and just keep working on it if i keep needing to improve Nice. Great. I, I think, uh, Uno, you were asking about a question about performance sculpting. I would say his whole stream here is a great example. He stayed really low, low, low polygon. He wasn't going really dense, and he showed examples. I don't know if you were here for the whole stream, um, but I, if you were not here, I'd, I'd recommend rewatching this stream um, because he's kind of he answered your question throughout the stream. Oh, can I mention how blown away I was by uh, Alexander Lee's stream? Oh yeah, his, his use of ZBrush. Oh my God, I was like intimidated after watching that. <laughs> was yeah. like, it's a definitely <laughs> different way, right? Of working. Yeah, Very it's incredible stuff. too. I'm also yeah. really inspired by. He said like you can sculpt anything with, uh, what was it snake hook and inflate? Yeah. And I was trying to visualize that workflow. I'm like, huh? And, and, and trim, trim adaptive. I think he said. Anyway, this is a big tangent, but I wanted to mention that because that was. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna try sculpting like that sometime and see how it works. Yeah, because he's got super super different way of incredible. using ZBrush, right? So yep. uh, yeah, it was definitely inspirational, and a lot of people were also watching. Like, wow, that's really different and cool. Yeah, for sure, they enjoyed it. Yeah, and just the fact that he's doing the stop motion. Anyway, anyway, yeah. amazing. <laughs> so check out that stream too if we get a chance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a good one. It was a fun one too. All right, I think those are all the questions. Anything else that you'd like to share, Alex? Uh, I think I think that about covers it. It's nothing more I can think of. Well, thank you again for um, doing this stream with us. I know people are also saying you inspired them too in here. Well, I'm flattered. Well, so I'm happy to uh, be here. It was fun. It was really, really great. And then, obviously, since we're talking about streams, there's more streams coming up. Um, so we might as well let everybody know there's a stream this Friday. Um, that's going to be doing some spacecraft stream this Friday. So you want to get into that with myself and another ZBrush expert that'll be coming through. So that's going to be at 11 o'clock Pacific time as well. And of course, if you've enjoyed, he brought up Alex Lee's stream. These are streams we're doing every Tuesday. So we already put in the next Tuesday one. So Brian Beatty, He's uh, going to be an industry spotlight and how he does all of, like his toy designing stuff. His stuff's awesome as well. I'm telling you, he's really like pop culture things. It's really, really cool work. So you're going to want to come see this stream as well. So again, every Tuesday we're doing these streams like we're doing here with Alex. So you all want to um, take a look at our calendar um, here that we have on ZBrush Live to learn about more streams. If you've enjoyed watching what Alex has been doing. Um, this channel's off and live as it is anyways, but we're doing some special streams. So again, we got one coming this Friday at 11, and we got another one next Tuesday with Brian Beatty. So I want to make sure you all were aware of that too. So, and then Alex, thank you again, man. That was awesome. And again, congratulations on that piece. It's gorgeous and becoming third. 
place. And every, I think one thing, everyone, go do some challenges. Yeah. Yeah. You get going on some challenges. You learn. I think it's true. You learn a lot by doing the challenge. It'll mm-hmm. put you in the, kind of the corner there. As I say with baby and Patrick Swayze's not there, you know, it makes you have to get out of there and figure out the way you're going to work. Yeah. You can push your own limits. It's great. Yeah. I've, they've been a great help to me and I'm sure a lot of people will have, have a lot of fun doing them if you have not tried them. And the communities around them are often fantastic too. So yeah. there's that aspect too. Yeah. I agree. All right. Well, thank you again, Alex. I'm Paul Gabriel again with another ZBrush Live, and you've been watching a, a ZBrush Central image breakdown with Alex Bohr. So we'll see you in the next stream, everyone. Bye. Thank you for watching. Yeah.